first um, talks that Kath and I saw at, a, at any kind of an event, at any kind of an atheist convention was in Burbank in 2009 where, where Lawrence spoke. I think it was the first time you did the universe talk, maybe. Well, for that version. Yeah, that version. And, um, I mean, it blew us away. It, that is what created um, the impetus to start a group here. That's what created the impetus to do this kind of an event. And um, I'm just so grateful to Lawrence that he uh, agreed to come. I um, mean, it wasn't uh, easy yet. I think you've been flying for, what, 30 days straight or something, pretty much. So um, I, I want to thank you so much for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Christ. by now, um, in which case we could have just gone for a cup of coffee. But anyway, uh, it was a privilege to speak after Miriam and, uh, uh, and, and, and the important message that, that she, she gave, which is really important. One of the nice things about cosmology is it doesn't matter. And um, um, so it's good to take you away from the problems of the, of the real world and the urgent problems that she talked about that I uh, thought she did such a wonderful job talking about. Um, I also will try not to make any fun of philosophers today. Um, <laughs> my reason for that is that I, I attend a little bit of the debate, and those two guys represented themselves as, as philosophers. So I think they made enough of a joke of the whole thing anyway, without me, without, without me doing that. I'm also acutely aware and, and honored that many of you have watched me in one form or another. Um, uh, on, on YouTube or on TV or, or in fact in lectures I recently gave uh, in both Vancouver and Calgary this year uh, at different times. Um, so I was feeling pretty badly about coming to talk on the subject I, and, and I didn't want to give, I never like to give the same talk anyway. But so I've, I've, there'll be overlap with the talks I've given but it won't be the same in any way and I want to emphasize different things. So for some of you who wanted to come and get the whole thing from scratch, I'm sorry, but but I thought I'd, I'd touch on some different topics just out of deference to the people who drove many hours and may have seen me somewhere else. Anyway, so, but nevertheless, most of it will be there. But I do want to make this unique and focus on some things. Also because of the, as I'll indicate, because of the specific point. Oops, there we go. Uh, I'd rather just listen to Monty Pythons all day. But anyway, um, I'm very upset about the fact that I played that song. I, I was honored to be asked to give the opening or keynote talk at, at a memorial service for my friend Christopher Hitchens in New York. And I've seen it on YouTube, but they took out the Monty Python's music, which really upset me. Anyway, um, my reason for giving that talk which, uh, at Burbank, which, which I guess inspired Bill in some way, was, was the same reason I, I, I talk about everything. It's, it's really not so much to attack ignorance as to, as to inspire people not to be ignorant. And, um, and one of the ways to do that, it seems to me, is to point out the remarkably amazing aspects of our universe, which I'll try and talk a little bit about, and, and really treat the idea of the universe as a mystery, because mysteries are what drive us forward. It's not the knowing things, it's the searching for things that makes life worthwhile, in my opinion. And so I, I will be guided, as I, as I try to be, by the real universe, and, um, uh, and, and this is a picture of the real universe as seen from a place other than where I used to live. As, I, as I, many of you heard me say in Cleveland, I used to always have to introduce lectures by showing people stars and saying, these are stars. But uh, uh, in Arizona, I don't have to anymore. Uh, and here, I noticed it was clear at least a few nights. So. But uh, the question that, I, that I've been trying to answer, or at least address, and which lately has caused so much controversy that surprised even me, among people I didn't expect to hear from, is the question, why is there something rather than nothing? And the reason that that's an important question to address uh, is that it's, a, it's normally framed as a religious question and a theological question or a philosophical question. Something is the, that is beyond the domain of science. And what is fantastic, it seems to me, is that science has progressed in the last uh, 40 years or so, uh, my field of science at least, to the point where that question and several other questions which we never thought would be addressable by science are at least addressable. We may not have answered and I want to make that clear, as I've tried to do. But we have 
led ourselves to a plausible resolution of how a universe could come from nothing by natural laws without any supernatural shenanigans. And just the fact that that's plausible is worth celebrating. But in the process, as always, science changes the way we think. That's what's good about science, because we change our minds, unlike religion. And one of the ways we've changed that is changing what we mean by these very words. That's all I'll talk about. So, I want to move from what is obviously the, the, the traditional answer that was given for many centuries is just this answer, which doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> You're in the beginning and then you write a book that doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> so, so, what is really important is not being guided by what the story we want to tell, but the story that the universe tells us. And that's, that's the story I want to tell. The story that we're driven to by this remarkable universe, the, the surface of which you just scratch when we take pictures like this. Because as beautiful, this is a globular cluster in our galaxy. But as beautiful as that is, it is just the tip of a cosmic iceberg. We have realized the really important stuff in the universe is not the stuff we can see, but the stuff we can't see. That's changed our picture of everything from the beginning to the end, as I'll, as I'll discuss at some length. Now, I, as I said, I want to jump in here and, 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 um, and not uh, go through some of the introductions I've done before. I just want to say that the picture of our universe changed completely when Albert Einstein discovered, theoretically, that the universe was describable and gravity was describable by a remarkable fact, the fact that space and time are dynamic. They're not fixed. They can respond to the presence of matter and energy. They can expand, they can contract, they can curve. And that changed everything, because it really gave us the first picture of space and time themselves, and therefore the first picture of the universe. It was really the first theory that was allowed us to describe the universe, because it was the theory not just of how objects move through space, but how space itself evolves. And the universe became dynamical. And the important question that arose after we discovered the universe was, ex was expanding. And again, as I say, I apologize to those of you who, I, who I, I'm not giving the opportunity to hear how we did that. But you can read the book. <laughs> um, the important question was what kind of universe we live in. Because it looked like the future of the universe was determined by geometry once we discovered that the universe could be curved. And a, a three-dimensional space could exist in one of three different kinds of geometry so-called open, closed, or flat. That's it. That's a complete description of the geometry of three-dimensional space. It also is the complete description of the geometry of two-dimensional space, and that's what these images are here for, but they shouldn't confuse you. And I think if I wrote the, the book again, I, I, in fact, in the paperback, I'm probably going to rewrite a page or two, because I, I still think I confuse people about what a flat universe means. So here are two-dimensional pictures of two-dimensional universes, because I can draw two-dimensional universes. I can't draw curved three-dimensional universes. I can't even picture them very well. I can picture them mathematically, but not intuitively because I'm stuck in three dimensions. I'm stuck in the universe in which we live, as, 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 most of, as all of you are, and as, 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 and as none of the Republican candidates in my country are. But, um, but uh, uh, um, because of that, it's, it's hard to picture, but we can... We can draw them, and, 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 and it's nice to see them here, a flat universe, like a flat piece of paper. The surface of a, of a sphere is a closed two-dimensional sphere, surface, and the surface of a, uh, an infinite satellite is an is a open two-dimensional surface. Now, as I say, in three dimensions it's more complicated, but a three-dimensional flat universe is just the universe you always thought you lived in, and this is what I would write in the book now, I think, if I if had a chance. It's just the universe that you've always felt you always lived in. It's a universe in which light travels in straight lines, and the three axes, X, Y, and Z, in deference to Canada, the X, Y, and Z axes are always remain in the same direction. In a curved universe, those axes in one place point in a different direction than they do in another place. That's it. So a flat universe is just a simple universe you thought you lived in. It's not flat like a pancake. It's just three dimensions as you always thought they were. Now, all of that sounds very nice and it's wonderful to, to, to use to, 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 you know, at bars. But, but the real important stuff is that in, in the case of a universe dominated by matter, the kind of universe we lived in determines the future. In a universe dominated by matter that's expanding now, uh, if it's open, it will go on expanding forever. 
In a closed universe, it will uh, expand and reach a maximum point and then stop and then return to a big crunch, the reverse of the Big Bang. And a flat universe is the boundary between these two. It's a universe that expands forever and slows down and never quite stops. Now, this was the picture we always told people. I've written about this in books, in old books of mine. And it was the picture that inspired me to go into cosmology, or at least spend part of my time doing cosmology. I'm a, by training a, a particle physicist. And, and I got into cosmology because I realized I thought I might be the, able to be the first person to know how the universe would end, which seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and, and because once I determined which universe we lived in by the geometry, I would know the future. And you'll see why particle physics determines we thought the geometry of the universe. So, the question that the holy grail of 20th century physics became which universe do we live in? That became the mission after we discovered the universe was expanding in 1929. And we spent 80 years or so trying to determine which universe we live in, and we now know the answer. And, I wanna, and we know it by weighing the universe. Because to determine the geometry of the universe is Geometry, since space is determined by the presence of matter and energy, we have to determine how much matter and energy there is in order to, to determine the geometry of the universe. And so I'll, I'll just give you, I will, I will show you how we've weighed the universe and, and, um, and how we've determined also the geometry of the universe. And I, I do want to uh, show you one thing which, which uh, some of you certainly at least have watched YouTube haven't seen. Uh, because it gives you a sense of how much science has changed in the last... Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of history, and, and um, I want to take you back to a kinder, gentler time. Um, 19, well, it wasn't that kind in the world, but it was kind in science. 1936, uh, when the, and this is the journal Science, which, uh, which is still a, a somewhat distinguished scientific journal. And uh, in that journal appeared a paper called Lens-like Action of a Star by the Deviation of Light and Gravitational Field. Sounds kind of tedious, but... Um, but I want to show you how it began, uh, especially for, the, there's some young people here, and I always like, I'm really talking to young people in general, I hope, because uh, I want to I wanna show you how things have changed a little bit, and, and some of you maybe are, are in university are going to go into, and may one day submit a paper to Science Magazine, and one day be rejected. <laughs> um, and, uh, so this paper began someday, some time ago, R.W. Mandel paid me a visit and asked me to publish the results of a little calculation which I had made at his request. This note complies with his wish. <laughs> now you try to do that today, okay? <laughs> try it. It won't last very long. It's just as a different time. Now the author had some credentials. The author was Albert Einstein, so maybe that'll help them along. <laughs> but, but what he was talking about in this paper was a calculation that he thought was entirely unimportant. And he, it was useless, in fact, in his mind. And it was a, the simple result. He'd already shown that light curves in the gravitational field. But that meant if you had a, a mass here, a large enough mass distribution, and a source of light behind it, the light rays from that source could go around and, be, and both curve around that mass distribution and converge again. And that would magnify the image. That would mean gravity can act like a lens. A star can act like a lens. And similarly, like a cut glass goblet, if you, which has many jagged edges, if you have a mass distribution that's irregular and you, and you pass the light rays around, it can produce many images. If I look through a cut glass goblet, I'd see many different images of you. So space can act like a lens. It's an interesting observation, but Einstein said it was so unimportant it would never be observed. Because he was largely illiterate about astronomy. <laughs> this is the calculation he did in 1936 in his notebook. It's not a, complex calculation. But the point is, he thought it was so unimportant that he'd forgotten. If you go to his notebooks in 1912, you can find exactly the same calculation. He did it in 1912, he just forgot he did it. Because he said it would never be important, never be. And, 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 and in fact, one of my favorite parts of this little history of science is the letter he wrote to the editor of Nature afterwards, or Science afterwards, where he said, let me also thank you for your cooperation with the little publication which Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. It is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. <laughs> so that's how science is done. Okay? In any case, he was wrong. It wasn't of little value. It allows us to weigh the universe. And, 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 and this picture is the phenomenon that Einstein said would never be observed. It's a Hubble Space Telescope picture. And it's one of the things that provides, and should provide us all inspiration. And those of people in this room who may like the word spiritual, it should provide you some spiritual something. Um, it's, it's a picture of a cluster of galaxies, 
Uh, the, uh, the, the, the really amazing thing about this picture is that every point in this picture is a galaxy, not a star. And, that, and, and this cluster of galaxies is a conglomeration of galaxies. Almost all galaxies live in clusters. They're the biggest bound objects in the universe, about 10 million light years across this picture. But this cluster is 5 billion light years away. That means the light left these stars before our Earth and Sun formed. The Earth and Sun are about 4.5 billion years old. So the, the light left before the Earth was even around uh, to, to capture the light, five billion, light, five billion years later. And the other thing is that each of these galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars, five billion years ago. So, and if there are stars like our sun, then most of them have burned out. So you can imagine there are civilizations living on those galaxies, in those, in those, around those stars that are long gone. We'll never, we'll never know about them. And there could be thousands of them in this image. We don't know. It's really kind of, to me, I find that inspirational. That aspect, every time I look at a picture like this, it causes me to think about things like that that I would never think about otherwise. That's why we need to keep looking at the universe, because it inspires us in a way that obviously myth and superstition don't. But in any case, this bound cluster, uh, is, well, there's some obvious, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that there are images here that are different than the others. They're blue things. Those blue things look different than the other galaxies. And what those blue things are, are multiple images of a single galaxy located five billion light years behind the cluster, 10 billion light years away from us. And we wouldn't even see that galaxy except for the fact that the space has magnified it and distorted it. Each of these is a different image of the same object. It's distorted it and produced multiple images just like that kind of glass goblet. It's amazing proof that space is curved around objects, it, that space can act like a lens. So it's validation of that very fact that Einstein said would never be observable. The important thing about science is that what, what is first a signal becomes background. And, when we, and, and it's amazing verification, but we actually understand general, general relativity. We don't need the verification. We can now use it for something else. We can, we can use it because we understand how mass curves space, and therefore we can use this image and ask how much mass is there in this system. We can weigh the system because we can ask where would the mass have to be distributed and how much of it would there have to be to produce precisely the image you see. It's a very complicated mathematical inversion, but you can do it. And the first people to do it are Tony Tyson and colleagues at Bell Labs a while ago. This is the inversion. So this is the, the, a picture of where the mass is in that cluster of galaxies. And you can see the spikes are where the galaxies are. But the really important thing is that the, most of the mass, this huge mountain of mass, is where the galaxies aren't. There's 40 times as much mass in this image as meets the eye. In fact, around each galaxy, there's more mass than meets the eye. Most of the mass of the system is not the very spike where the, where the visible mass is, but this, these halos around. 40 times as much mass as shines. And as I say, physicists are very creative. We call that dark matter. And the remarkable thing, the things that makes it very exciting and inspirational to some of us, and really the reason I got in the field, in fact, is that there's so much of this dark matter that we can say with virtual certainty that it can't be made of the same stuff as you and me. We know how many protons and neutrons are in the universe. It's a triumph of cosmology, which, which I won't talk about today. I'm maybe in the question period if there's one. But we know how many of them there are because we can test that idea, not because we know, because by revelation, but we know because we can test <laughs> the idea. And there's 10 times too much stuff here to be accounted for by protons and neutrons, which make you and everything in this room up. And that means that this dark matter, we're virtually certain, is some new type of elementary particle, which makes it very exciting, because it's not just in that galaxy or in, those, in that cluster. It's, of course, in our galaxy, in our cluster, and it's not just out there. It's in this room, going right through you now. And that means we can do experiments here in this room to look for dark matter. We do, wouldn't do it in this room because we're above ground and we're bombarded by cosmic rays all the time. So we build experiments underground because the cosmic rays get shielded. But this dark matter, we think, interacts so weakly, that's why it doesn't emit light, that most of it goes right through the Earth without knowing it was there. But we can build experiments which can be very sensitive. Most of the dark matter particles go right through the Earth as if they didn't know it was there, but some of them will, will stop. In fact, one of the things I'm, I'm proud of, I suppose, is that I, that I proposed the experiments 25 years ago that are now being used to, to look for dark matter. Here's such an experiment. It's really quite simple. Um, 
well, it's simple for me to talk about it, so it's simple to do it. But uh, um, this is a boule of germanium, same stuff that makes up your computer chips. And if you cool it down to about one one thousandth of a degree above absolute zero, um, which you can do easily enough, uh, then most of the dark matter particles will go right through the Earth without anyone who's there, but every now and then one of them will bounce off, simply bounce off the nucleus of germanium, heating the whole thing up by one one thousandth of a degree or so. And, we're, and it's amazing. I mean, the hard part is that the event rate you expect in a tech like this is maybe one event per every 10 years. And uh, you're looking for a change in temperature by one one thousandth of a degree or an energy deposit of, well, the units that don't really matter, that's very small. So you're looking for very small energy deposits very rarely. And then you have to worry about radioactivity. And it's a, real, it's a real triumph that experimentalists can even do this. But they have done it. And there are experiments like this being built all around the world. One, it's some going to be done in Sudbury, where there's a deep mine, uh, and other places. No one, well, except for a group in Italy that's wrong, no one's actually seen um, <laughs> anything. Um, but we may one day know what the dark matter is, what the identity of the dark matter is by experiments like this. And the other thing that makes it even more exciting and timely, perhaps, is that we don't have these dark matter particles, by the way, were created at the beginning of time, we're created in the early universe. If we detect them, we'll get a signature in some ways of what the universe looked like. It's something like a millionth of a billionth of a second old. But we don't have to just wait for that necessarily because we can create them. We can try and create conditions that are similar to those when the universe was a millionth of a billionth of a second old. And there are places on Earth where we have those kind of conditions, most notably now and outside Geneva at the Large Hadron Collider where we, for brief times and very small scales, create those conditions. I hope, and haven't created a black hole that will destroy the world. <laughs> but we create those conditions, and therefore we might actually create these particles. So it's a race right now between the people who have detectors like this underground and the people at the Large Hadron Collider to see whether, who can discover the nature of dark matter and discover what particle it is. And then we'll know the dominant stuff in the universe. Because, as this is clear, we are not the dominant stuff in the universe. That a lesson I'll keep repeating over and over again. You, we, and you in particular, not me so much, but you in particular, <laughs> are insignificant. <laughs> anyway, uh, more insignificant than we ever imagined. And so much for a universe made for us, as, as, as I pointed out. Okay, so, but we don't have to know what it is. We just have to know for the moment to determine the future how much of it there is. So we go back to this picture, and this picture has allowed us to weigh the universe, because anything that could fall into anything will fall into a cluster of galaxies. And so if we can measure clusters, we can weigh the universe, and we have finally done so, and this is the answer right there, and there's people fainting in the back, I see. Um, this is, when physicists have an important number, they give it a, a Greek letter to sound scholarly. And, um, and this number is omega, is the ratio of the total amount of stuff there is in the actual universe, divided by the amount you'd need to make an exactly flat universe. And if omega is 1, the universe is flat. If omega is bigger than 1, the universe is open. If omega is less than 1, the universe is... is uh, sorry, if omega is bigger than 1, the universe is closed. If it's less than 1, the universe is open. And so what we seem to have discovered with 95% certainty, in fact, far more than 95% certainty, because you'd have to be many more than uh, one away to get to 1, that the universe unambiguously appears to be open. We seem to have answered that holy grail which got me into cosmology. The universe is open, and therefore, if it's dominated by matter, it will expand forever. Is what? Open uh, the oh, Open is the saddle for two-dimensional. Okay. Paper is the flat. Okay. So, but there's a problem. And that is, we thought we lived on the paper. In fact, as I, as I point out, we knew we did. We, we theorists knew that we lived in a flat universe. We always know the answer. <laughs> We're not often right, but we always know the answer. And, and the flat universe is the only mathematically beautiful universe, so we were convinced we lived in that. I'll show you another reason why we're, in fact, more relevant to this discussion, why we were pretty certain we lived in a flat universe. But, um, but here these damn, and I can use that word here, these damn observers uh, kept coming up with the wrong answer, as they always do. And, uh, and so we were concerned. Well, it turned out, this is, of course, obviously a flawed way of determining the geometry of the universe, because you're, you, you're, weighing, you're weighing the universe, you're plugging into Einstein's equations, you're comparing it to the expansion rate, you're looking at things, and then at the end, you work out what the curvature of the universe is. 
it would be much better to measure the curvature of the universe directly. And that we have been able to do in the last 15 years, amazingly. Amazingly to me in particular, because I was amazed when they did it, but then I was even more amazed, like maybe like Einstein, discovered I'd actually published a paper 10 years earlier about it, and I'd totally forgotten. Um, I didn't think it would ever be observable. But we have, the, we have measured the curvature of the universe, and I just want to show you the result. I'm not going to give you all the preamble here, because I want to get to some other stuff. The result is the following. We used the most important observable in cosmology, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the afterglow of the Big Bang, the baby, that gives us a baby picture of the universe. When the universe was 100,000 years old, it was opaque. We can't see past that point. But then it became neutral, matter became neutral, because the temperature of the universe at that time was about 3,000 degrees. The universe was a plasma, and it was opaque. But after, as it cooled down below that temperature, Protons captured electrons, matter became neutral, and neutral matter is transparent to radiation, basically. And so when we look out, we can look out as far as we can look at the universe until we get to that point, just like I can look out as far as I can until I get to this wall. The wall is opaque. And so if I look out, if there's a prediction there was a Big Bang, if I look out far enough, I should see radiation coming at me from all directions from that moment when the universe became transparent. And the universe was 3,000 degrees then, but it's cooled now. It's about three three degrees, and, and that radiation was discovered by accident in New Jersey, of all places, by two people who didn't know what the hell they were doing. But it's okay, they won the Nobel Prize anyway, because you don't have to know what you're doing to win the Nobel Prize, it's a clear You don't really, you just have to discover something. And uh, they discovered this radiation, and it, and it changed our, it, it was one of the fundamental bits of evidence that told us the Big Bang really happened. Now we can take a picture now of that radiation. That picture, by the way, is one of another Nobel Prize because it's a baby picture of the universe. And here is one of the first experiments to, to take a picture on the scale that was necessary. This is the boomerang experiment in Antarctica. It's a balloon and a microwave receiver. That went, and this radiation is now in the microwave band. It was sent way above the Earth's surface, away from the heat of the Earth, and went around the world, which of course is easy to do in Antarctica, in the South Pole. Just do this, and um, and uh, but there it was at the edge of Antarctica, and um, and and it took an image of this radiation. And what's really important in this picture is that it's looking for these hot spots and cold spots. These, by the way, are the primordial lumps created at the beginning of time by mechanisms I'll talk about in a second. And people don't normally get to hear about, but you will. Um, that, that tell us, by the way, we're all here due to quantum mechanics. It's really amazing. We don't celebrate it enough, it seems to me. But they were created in the very first instant of the Big Bang, and they would later collapse to form all the galaxies, clusters and galaxies and stars and planets and aliens and everything. This was what, these were the primordial little lumps that would later collapse to all the structure that you saw in that later picture. And it's really amazing that we can look back 13.7 billion years look at that image of that baby picture. But the important thing is the size of these. Because we know the, so the physical size of these lumps is about 100,000 light years across, because those are the biggest lumps that could, could have collapsed at the moment the universe was 100,000 years old, because nothing travels, no information travels faster than light. And so to collapse, you have to know that you're a lump. To know you're a lump, you have to have light be able to travel across you. So these are 100,000 light years across, but how big do they look? And that's the point, because just like in those images I showed you before, in a universe where light doesn't travel in straight lines, if you have a ruler that's 100,000 light years across, if the light travels in straight lines, we would expect the lumps to be about one degree across. But in an open universe, it turns out the light rays diverge as you go back in time, and the same ruler will look smaller, maybe half a degree. And in a closed universe, the light rays converge as you go back in time. And so the same ruler will look bigger. So really, it's just causality. It tells you, you just look at these lumps and say, how big are they? And that tells us directly the geometry of the universe. It's amazing. And so to compare this image with, with, with various universes, this is a different false color image of the same picture. We can create universes on a computer, closed, open, flat, in this case, three-dimensional. And these and, and then generate lumps of 100,000 light years across at random and, and, and ask what it would look like. And in a closed universe, the lumps would look this big, but these are bigger than these lumps. And in an open universe, the lumps would look this big. The same physical size, but they look that big. These are smaller than these lumps. 
But just like Goldilocks, in a flat universe, it's just right. We now know to an accuracy of 1% or so that the universe is flat. In fact, this is a mathematical way of presenting the same picture that I don't normally show. But the, the, the prediction, the curves for a flat universe and the data are the points. Unbelievably, perhaps, the universe is flat. So we can pass.